Welcome everyone to our webinar, Making Sense of Online Marketing for Nonprofits. Thank you so much for joining us today. As I'm sure many of you already know, online marketing is such a big opportunity for your nonprofit. Stats really show that online donations are a key funding source for nonprofits, especially when it comes to end of year giving, and that's going to be here before we even know it. In 2017, stats showed an increase of 23% in online giving. And that percentage continues to grow over the last couple of years. 8.7% of the total fundraising from last year stemmed from online giving. And then last year as well, it was estimated that 26% of online do donations were made using mobile devices online. Now, in total, about 30% of online giving, that is going to occur in December, with 10% typically happening in those last three days of the year. And also last year, I want to point out that Giving Tuesday, it's a big opportunity every single year. But last year, it raised over 28% from, uh, from that. Now, the thing is, you really just want to make sure that you're, you're planning ahead, and that's why we're talking about this. You really just want to make sure you spend some time now and set up some foundations, get those in place to make sure you're setting yourself up for success for year-end giving and into next year as well. Online marketing is really going to give you the power to reach your donors and build relationships with people, and that's going to lead to your success. And it's not just about cherry picking which tools you want to use. You want to make sure you're using a variety of tools together to get the most impact. And we're going to talk about those tools today. If you've been trying to do online marketing for a while for your organization, you might feel a little bit frustrated. It probably isn't as easy as many claim it to be. And that can feel overwhelming to a lot of you, I know. And that's really what we, why we put together this webinar. We want to help you to easily understand and navigate this world of online marketing. You want to, we want to help you to understand the fundamentals so that you can get the most out of the tools that are available to you, so that you can run a successful year-end campaign and even into next year. So let's see more specifically what we're going to be covering in today's webinar. We're going to start by talking about how people find you online, and that's going to set a good foundation for the next section, which is how to set yourself up for success. And that's where we'll talk about five important tools that you want to make sure are set up. Last but not least, we're going to talk about how that all comes together in the end. Before we get into all of these details, I would like to go ahead and just introduce myself just a little bit more, as well as our guest speaker for the day. My name is Stephanie French, and I'm the content manager for webinars here at Constant Contact. And I'm really excited to introduce Michelle Hickey, founder of Silver Lining Communications. Do you want to say hello, Michelle? We can't hear you, Michelle. I think you're muted. Try it again. Let's see if your audio comes back on. Ah, there we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here I am. Hi, yes, I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be working with Constant Contact, and I'm thrilled to have my nonprofit peeps out there uh, and to offer anything I can to help them do their jobs a little better and a little easier. Yes, Michelle has a lot of expertise in this, this space, and that's why I'm so excited to have you here. So thank you so much again for joining us, and I'm very glad your audio came back on as well. <laughs> All right, before we dive in too much today, I do want to go ahead and run a poll. So let me go ahead and launch that on your screen. So what do you find to be the most difficult part of online marketing for your nonprofit? Is it finding donors, figuring out what to post on social media and send via email, keeping your website updated, finding the time to manage all of your online marketing, or is it about finding the best tools to use? What are your biggest struggles? We'll give everyone just a couple of minutes to uh, go ahead and share their answers with us.
So far, I see figuring out what to post on social media and send via email is currently in the lead. And we've got lots of other answers coming in. A lot of people saying find the best time to man or finding the time to manage it all, finding the best tools to use, finding donors. They're actually evening out a little bit now. We'll give everyone just another minute or so to uh, give us your vote and then we'll close it and we'll share the results. All right, so we're holding steady at about 77%. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and I'm gonna share the results here. So we had uh, three answers with 26% of people answering them. So figuring out what to post on social media, finding the time to manage it all, finding the best time to use, and then 19% uh, finding donors. So that's really interesting on, on how that played out. So thank you for sharing that. So let's go ahead and start to talk about how people really find you online. Because again, it's all about setting foundations to help you with some of those biggest struggles that you are just sharing in the poll. And I wanna start by talking about this whole idea of word of mouth, because this is how I myself find, uh, find out about causes online, and I know a lot of other people do as well. Now, there are a few ways that people can find out about you in general, but word of mouth is really, you know, happening on online today. And here are just a few examples that we see on this screen. On the left, you know, you've, we've got it where on social media you can ask for or you can share recommendations about, you know, nonprofits that you really care about. Uh, people can also run their birthday fundraisers, which is what we see here in the middle. And that really allows people to show their support for their favorite organizations and let all their friends know about that. And then they can even spread the word about their favorite organization's efforts and campaigns like we see over here on the right, where they're trying to encourage their friends to support the organization by buying some raffle tickets. Now, the thing with all of this word of mouth is being online is going to allow you to be a part of those conversations. And, you know, I've actually adopted a dog this way, you know, asking people for a rescue organization that they've worked with before. And then what I do is once I've got a few recommendations from people, I can actually turn to an online search and I'm actually going to want to find out a little bit more about them. Some people may start out this way where they're just going to Google and doing a search, um, or they might go out there and they might just not even know that your organization exists. So there's a couple of ways they can do that search. So Michelle, I was hoping you might be able to walk us through what comes up in each of these different search results. Mm -hmm. So in this first example, we're searching by the organization's name. In the example on the screen, constant contact. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what will come up first is uh, a paid ad. So when you type a keyword, because that's when you do a search, that's what you're doing. You're typing in what are called keywords into the search field. So the search engine, whether it's Google or another search engine, will match that to what it finds in the vast world of the internet. Of course, those organizations that have paid into the to advertise in these, the search engines will come up first because they have paid. Um, it's sort of like the difference between the white pages and the yellow pages, if anyone remembers what a phone book was. Uh, organic listing, well then there's Google My Business, and that is when um, it matches with an organization that has claimed and completed its Google My Business uh, profile. And that is something that we will talk about a little bit later but you can see it gives you this very nice presentation over to the right with a photo and other information. That information doesn't get there by accident. You know, the organization that is being represented has played a role in making sure that that information is there. Following that will be organic listings, and those are the organizations that, through just being present on the internet, will match up with the keywords that you've typed, and the search engine will pull those up in the order that the search engine feels most matches what you are looking for. 
Yes, if there's one thing you do after today, make sure that you've got a Google My Business listing. It's going to play into a few different things that we're talking about today. But the reason being is it's taking up so much real estate in the search over on that right hand side of the screen. And then on mobile, it's one of the first things people are going to see in that result as well. So the other way that people might find out about you is they just go out there and they do a search by some keywords or long tail uh, phrases like rescue pet adoptions. And this actually looks just a little bit different than what we saw in the previous one. Could you tell us what we're seeing here? Well, what these uh, ser searches bring up are connected very much to uh, listings and review sites. So Google My Business functions in somewhat that way as well, but you've probably all heard of Yelp. Uh, and there, you know, there are other similar sites like that, but Google and Yelp are the biggest ones. And they offer, look, I mean, you can look at the wealth of information. It's showing you where these organizations are. It's showing, giving you links to the website. It will give you directions to their physical location. Uh, and then the all important stars, you know, if people have re reviewed those organizations or those sites, then that shows up. In these listings as well, and I'm sure if you you know if you've used a rest you know done a restaurant search, you know and you've looked for what you know a place to eat, you're going to look at those reviews, and it it's going to mean something to you. What even just looking at the stars, and then if you decide to dig further and look at what uh, people are saying about the organization. Definitely, that's just another way that you you know Google My Business is pulling into these search results. Uh, plays a big role and especially with those reviews you've got the website information and because nonprofit most nonprofit organizations are such a, a local uh, institution mm -hmm. you know you can see that information on the right there now if we were to use that same search result and scroll down the page a little bit um, can you talk about what we see here well you're going to see cause specific listings um, it again it the the uh, search engine is matching what it finds on the internet to what you have typed into the search engine. So you want to think about what your people are going to be searching for when they're looking for you. Now, if you're looking for a pet, you might type pet, pet rescue. If you're looking for uh, a food bank, you might type those words in. There might be some other words that you would type in. Uh, but that is, when, when you're talking about where, how well you appear on a search engine, you're really trying to match what people are looking for, what they're typing in, and then you're trying to be competitive so that you appear earlier in that listing. Because the further down you are in the listing, the less likely it is uh, that people are going to find you and click on you. I, I think that's really important thinking about what people are actually searching for that would end up using your organization or going to your website or something like that. Now, a few other things that don't show up in this specific example that could show up in the search results are your social media profiles, even more listing and review sites and things like that. Now, after today's webinar, I really encourage you to go out there, run a search for your own organization, do it by your name, and then do it by those other types of keywords that people should be looking for in order to find you. You want to see what shows up, and that'll help you to come up with a game plan on what you might need to do to fix that. So now you've got a good understanding of what shows up in those search results and how people can find you. Ultimately, you want to make sure you have a variety of different tools and places that could show up in those search results. And what I want you to keep in mind is that eventually people are going to be clicking into those search results. They're going to want to know that you offer the right services for their needs or that they're the organization that they want to be involved with and, you know, volunteer or support. You really just want to make sure that you're answering some of their questions that they have, especially on their website. Are you open or when are you open? Uh, do you uh, offer any sort of pet services or helping me find the right type of pet? All of that really plays into it. All right, so now we've got that good foundation. Let's break it down into the different tools that you'll want to use for online marketing success. There are five foundational tools I want you to keep in mind here. First and foremost, a mobile responsive website, an email marketing tool, 
at least one primary social media channel that you're actively using. Up-to-date business listings is where the, the reviews start to tie into, and also an easy way to create content. So I want to break it down with you, Michelle, and talk about each of these and how our audience can really use them in their strategy. First up is that mobile responsive website. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that the website plays and why it's so important? Well, I think it's important to look at your website as your digital storefront. And I can actually remember a time when um, people would be suspect of an organization they found on the internet. I feel like things have reversed. If, you're, if you don't have a website, if you, don't, if you aren't appearing on the internet, I think the question is, does it really exist? It, it weirdly has gone from being a very suspicious thing to being a very legitimizing thing, which probably is just plays more into how long I've been using the internet. But that, <laughs> that, that aside, um, it, in 2019, it was reported that 90% of adults in the United States are using the internet. Now, my guess is that in 2020, it, it, it must have gone up. I mean, how, how could yeah. it have not? So I think you have to ask yourself as an organization, if you want people to find you at all, um, you need to have a presence and, and, and having a website is a, is a very legitimizing thing to do. I totally agree. And the website is something that you're going to have full control over. You can put the information there that you need. You can put those images that are really going to connect with your audience. Mm -hmm. So what are some really important tips for our organizations to think about for their website and especially thinking of end of year success? Well, I always recommend having a donate now button on every page. And I know that there are a lot of organizations that re have resisted that in the past. But um, I, I think it, it, there's just no reason to make people hunt for that kind of a thing. Make sure that your contact information is up to date and that it's easy to find a real person to contact, I think, especially when you're talking about fundraising. Uh, you know, when, some, when a donor has a question, they need to be able to find a person. Um, and, I, and I don't think you ever want to, to not have that available for them. Uh, I think you want to design your site with your ideal visitors in mind. And for a nonprofit, I think it's a little bit different than, than sometimes a, a, a company that's in a different type of business because you have clients, you have volunteers, you have donors, you have multiple audiences. So that's probably a little bit of a unique challenge, but you do want to have in mind, why are these people visiting your website and what would make them want to stay? What do you want them to do while they're there? What is the, the call to action for each of these? Um, make it easy for people to find what they need. You know, I, I know that there are statistics that, you know, once you get past two clicks, your visitor is gone. Um, so you want to make sure that you have at the very least a home page, an about us page where you're talking about your vision and mission and what you do. Uh, you want a program and services page, which is up to date, especially if there are uh, hours of business and class times, you know, things like that are, are in there. You want to make sure that it's always current and correct. Um, you want, in addition to the donate now button, you want to support us page, which is where you would talk about how donors support your work and what the impact of that is. And then you want to have, you know, some contact us information. And I think as, in as many places as possible, you want to have something that tells them what your impact is. Why is your community a better place because of your work? I really like your points about, you know, creating it for the different audiences who will want to use your services. Then you're going to have those people who want to support you, volunteer or donate or whatever the case may be. So definitely make sure you're, you're considering the audience. Now, Michelle has actually written a great blog post on the Constant Contact blog, and it really dives into creating a great website in a lot more detail. So I'll have Rachel share a link to that in the chat window if you want to learn more. Let's go ahead and talk about, or, or start to talk about the next tool. On your website, you can start to incorporate your email marketing. And this is where we recommend adding a sign up form so that you can have an influence on people who maybe visit your website, but don't fully engage, like sign up for a service or click a link to donate. You wanna have a way to contact them later on. That gives you the ability to influence them on your terms 
really get in front of them with more donation information or what your organization is all about. That's going to be really important. Let's talk a little bit more about email marketing and the strategy. Can you talk about how our organizations can effectively use email, especially to drive year-end giving? Well, email is a great way to, to put your stories out there. And I was sort of interested to see that uh, organizations feel like, or some people feel like they're struggling to, to figure out what to put out through their email. Um, because it, it offers such a rich uh, variety of ways that you can share stories, either through, you know, obviously through text, but, you know, photos and videos, uh, you know, really when you, you think about it, you know, a, a nice, you know, set of photographs from your last, you know, community event is such an easy way to have content. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of time writing. You know, you, you have some photographs, you know, you might need to get permissions, you know, if there are people included in the photographs. But I, I think it's um, a great way to build excitement, to show how excited people are to work with you. And also, again, going back to showing the impact that you're having in the community, because that is such an important factor. Um, I did have some examples that, of ways that you can combine uh, the, the images and the stories and the data. So, for example, if you have an, art, you know, an arts program, you can show data about how many students took classes. You can include a story about, say, uh, a former student who wanted a scholarship to a great art school. And you can show images of the artwork. I mean, it's, a, it's just a, a great platform for pulling all of that together and helping people feel good about being part of your list and your organization. And also, too, before I forget, I would always include links to important pages in your website. So in your emails, you want to, again, have that Donate Now button. And you want to think about throughout your email, where would you like to drive people? It might be to uh, an upcoming events page, it might be to uh, a new programs page. So just think about that as well as, you know, the email in itself is a conduit to lead people to other places. So where would you like that to go? And also to your social media. Exactly. And I always say that in your email campaigns, you should have a call to action, you know, even if it just links to your website for people to learn out more, learn mm -hmm. more or to read a success story on your blog or something like that. Mm -hmm. Email really does have the power and the flexibility to do a lot of things and not just promote your your fundraising campaigns. Let's talk a little bit more about social media. What are some of the other ways that nonprofits can use social channels to really gain attention and even raise funds? Well, I like the way that uh, you, you've put them here, and I think Constant Contact does a really good job of this, of suggesting awareness, engagement, and action. And social media is a great place to do that. You know, you can have your regular awareness stories, which inform people about your mission and about your impact and what you're doing. And then you can offer uh, opportunities for engagement. You know, you've got the, the Amazon smile there and there may be other things that people can do. You know, they can like and share you. They can, uh, you know, you can ask them to post a video of something related to your work. Those are things that are, they make it easy for people to feel like they're doing something meaningful. And they are because they're they're helping to spread the word about your organization. But they they feel like they're involved. They feel like they're ha they, that they themselves are having an impact in the community. And then you can follow with the action, which is you know making a gift or signing up for an event, uh, signing up to be a volunteer. Um, it's just a, a great little funnel of you know getting people in more and more and more increasingly involved in your organization. Totally agree. And, the, you know, you're going to be able to reach even more people, especially when people t start to share all the things that you're sharing in mm -hmm. on your social media. Now, Facebook itself actually has a lot of uh, fundraising tools that I've seen people using. I shared that example at the beginning of the birthday fundraiser. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for really leveraging those tools for fundraising? I think, you know, if you start with the, the people closest to you, um, I think it's great to invite people not only to celebrate birthdays that way you can celebrate an anniversary a graduation um i've seen couples do this at weddings you know give to our you know our our favorite organization so i think that 
there's a, a million, you know, it's as much as, you know, what your, your imagination, as far as your imagination takes you, you can come up with ideas for um, leveraging those kinds of tools. Definitely, and you can oh. start to, oops, I was go say, ahead. There's one that I thought of that actually you and I didn't talk about before, which is the matching gift. Uh, you know, a challenge gift or a matching gift, you'll, you'll see every now and then organizations, I know radio stations do them publicly a lot, but if you have a donor who is, say, for Giving Tuesday might, might commit, say, you know, $2,500 that they would match every new gift that comes into the organization. You know, it's a great little uh, publicity giving tool that helps you build a little excitement, it builds a little challenge. Um, and I've also seen uh, with schools, and I, there might be a way to do this for other types of organizations where different classes might compete against each other to uh, raise money. So I know I'm looking at this whole lot of love or latte love and make it fun. Like there are different things that you could do to make it make it fun as well. Make it fun and make it competitive if you can. And I like that whole idea of the matching gifts thing. Yeah. I know yeah. I feel extra good you know if I can contribute a little bit of money and then my company exactly. will match that gift I love exactly. that uh, exactly it makes your gift twice the value exactly perfect well let's go ahead and talk a little bit about listings and reviews which these should definitely be a part of your strategy and I know I've recently had a conversation with uh, with a few people who aren't quite sure about the role that listings and reviews play for nonprofits. Can you talk about how that plays a role? Yes, um, and we saw at the beginning that participating in listings and, and reviews bumps up your uh, your frequency or your ability to appear in searches. So put that over on the side. That that in itself is an important thing. Um, I like to think of it again as you know your phone book and yellow pages. When people are looking for you, they're going to look at in a search engine and how well you come up. And when you come up with things like uh, uh, Yelp uh, rate, uh, ratings and reviews, again, it just adds even more legitimacy to your organization. It gives people confidence. You know, if you've got a, a five-star review, people think, oh, okay, you know, people had a really good experience with this. And by the way, once you uh, decide to go into that arena, you can ask people to leave reviews. But I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. The first thing you want to do is, as Stephanie said, do a search on your own organization and see where you're being listed and then claim your listings and fill in all as much information as you can and um, maintain them. You know, you, you're going to need to, from every few months or once a year, review those listings to make sure that they remain accurate and in, in good shape. Uh, I've also listed here uh, GuideStar and Charity Navigator. GuideStar in particular is, um, if you haven't heard, heard of it, is a database of every nonprofit organization in the United States. If you file a, uh, a tax return, a 990 tax return, you're listed in GuideStar whether you know it or not. So this is, I think, a really good listing to claim. And what GuideStar has done is they allow you to add other information about your organization, your, your mission, uh, your, uh, the names of your board members, um, other financial information, and they've started to offer what they call badges. So you can, depending on how much information you put in, you could earn a bronze, gold, or platinum badge, and it speaks to the transparency of your organization and, and how, how responsibly you're behaving with regard to your uh, position as a 501c3 organization in the community. Um, so, I mean, it's a free listing. It takes a little time to complete it, but it's a really nice thing to be able to say, look, you know, we have a, a guidestar.org platinum badge. You can put that on your website. You can put it in your emails. You can do a whole series of announcements about it uh, in your email program yeah. uh, and on social media. So uh, all of these things are, in addition to your website, they they create legitimacy and um, regard and respect for your organization. Definitely. And we've also got this other bullet here on the screen, you know, responding to reviews. I know it's a yeah. kind of another thing to add to the list, but that's going to be yeah. important as well. Do you have any tips for how 
uh, for suggestions on how to reply, good or bad? Well, first, make sure that you're paying attention and that you're seeing the comments. That's number one. If you don't pay attention and you don't see the comment, you're not going to be able to respond to it. Um, if it's uh, anytime you get a good a good review or a good comment, I think it's really nice to say thank you. If somebody walked up to you at your organization and said they had a great experience, you would thank them. So there's no reason not to do that in the digital world either. Um, if someone has a problem with the organization, I really recommend don't try to go head on in the internet space. Your, um, your, I think your best response is to um, exp acknowledge the, the issue and ask the individual to connect with you offline so that you can try to amend whatever the situation is. I think that's your, your best strategy. And I will say this, you know, in terms of donors, I mean, cl you know, clients and donors, but I know in terms of donors, anytime I've dealt with a donor who was unhappy, if we were able to turn the situation around, that individual almost always became one of the most loyal donors ever. And I think it was because they felt that they were, they were heard, even if everything couldn't be fixed perfectly to their liking. Pow responding is really powerful in a lot of ways. You know, it's it, you can change that situation. Hopefully they'll change the review. But that also provides that transparency that you do care and you want to make the situ situation right to the other people who see that review. So really good point. So the last tool, the fifth tool is uh, content. Content is really what people are out there searching for, they consume it, and then they can share it online. And that ultimately helps you to drive traffic from search results. I always say that the content really should start with a blog on a website, and that's going to make it searchable. So mm. let's talk about some of the types of content that nonprofits might include on their blog. Well, let's see. I think, again, you have to go back and think about the different audiences. Uh, because you have clients, you have volunteers, you have donors. Um, I think one of the, the things to start with is really a bit of a content calendar to help you think through that. Again, I'm going, thinking back to the survey that you took where people are, are struggling with that. Uh, but ev think of it this way. Every, every one of your stories can and should show your impact in the community. But the stories themselves can range from uh, a client's experience. It can be um, helpful information. It can be a donor's story. Um, it can be, you know, something that you, you know, a public event or, you know, something that you did in the community. Um, let's see. I did have some other ideas here. Uh, have volunteers and donors talk about why they support you and why they're excited have grateful clients talk about how your work helped them um, i think uh it really is as far as your imagination can go and you again going back to to fun like one of the the examples i i was thinking of recently was well if you had a food bank wouldn't it be fun to say invite local restaurant chefs to create recipes out of pantry items, things you know, things that people have in their pantries, and it, it kind of speaks to the mission of the organization. But it's fun, and it gets the community involved. You know, you, you could have you know a recipe contest, you know, for even you know to add another layer. You know, it's really you know your your imagination is really the limit. I, one thing I'm finding throughout everything I'm talking to you about today is story. The power of story is so yeah. powerful, especially yeah. for nonprofits. Yeah. It should play a role in everything. And the everything. thing I love about content, if we're talking about content on a blog, a lot of people think that's so much work. It's just one other thing to add. But having content on your blog is going to start to fuel those other areas that you might be struggling with. Well, what do I write in an email or what do I post on mm -hmm. social media? Mm -hmm. It starts to, you know, expand and you can share it in those other channels. So I love that. Now I have, uh, Stephanie, one organization that I work with that they don't spend a lot of time creating their own content. They're very community based and um, the emails that they use really share content from others. They sort of do this, they've been doing all, they do, um, they do education programs for educators, and they've been doing all summer these roundups of use, what they call useful resources. And the, you know, it's it's 
they've gotten a really nice response to it. So they're not even creating the content. They're really just gather, scooping up content from other places. And it's been great, a win-win. It's been great for the organizations that are trying to promote their work. And it's been a real service to the followers of this organization. That's great because that's another great way that you can still accomplish this content piece, but also save yourself a little bit of time as well. So that's a great yes. point. <laughs> we could Absolutely. all use a little more time. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So those are the five foundational elements, and this next one is actually a bonus. We're not going to talk a ton about it today, but once you have those five tools in place, you can start to add some paid ads to amplify your efforts and really reach people. The thing is, paid ads through Google search and even Facebook and Instagram, they're going to give you the ability to really target the people who are going to be right to uh, support your organization. And whether you're looking to drive website traffic, donations directly, or you can even use what's called Facebook lead ads to really grow your email list. So I know there's a question that came in and we'll address it here when we get to the Q&A session here in a couple of minutes and we can uh, address some of those questions about it. Um, let's go ahead and just quickly recap those five essential tools you want to make sure that you have to get online. So again, make sure you have a mobile responsive website and it really kind of serves as your online hub and something that you own and something you have full control over. Then you need the email marketing tool to start communicating with people, a primary social media channel for people to find you and also to spread the word about your organization, up-to-date business listings where you can get the word out about your organization, they can find you and also collect some reviews, and then there's that easy way to create content. So let's go ahead and recap how this all is going to come together for you. So again, you need a mobile responsive website, and we didn't really address it too much, but responsive means that your website is going to look great no matter where people are viewing it. In this example here on the screen, it's wider on a desktop computer, and it gets skinnier if you're on a, a tablet or even using a mobile phone. The thing is, your website really should be used as a resource for potential clients, participants, volunteers, or donors of your organization. And then on that website, you want to start to tie in uh, your email marketing. You want to capture email addresses right from your website visitors, and that's going to allow you to influence them later on with your year-end fundraising and even to get them involved, whether it's donating or volunteering their time. And then with email marketing, this is really where you can start to tie in those stories that Michelle is talking so much about. That's going to help you to build relationships with people. It's not just about, you know, asking for uh, donations and, you know, sharing your campaign, but it's about sharing that helpful, exclusive information and keeping people updated on the stories and things that are happening with your organization, the progress you're making in those campaigns and things like that. That's going to help you to stay top of mind. And then for social media, don't forget, this is where you really want to make sure you're interacting and engaging with people. Don't just put up a page and let people start talking about, their, about you. Be there and be a part of the conversation. You want to drive awareness, uh, engagement, and then also encourage people to take action and get involved with your organization. And then don't forget about reviews. I think a lot of nonprofits they feel this isn't necessary, but it definitely is. You know, that's another way that you're going to get found online. And that's also how other people are going to vet out whether, whether you're an organization they want to give their money to or uh, get involved with in some way or another. And also along with that, that means you want to make sure you're responding to those comments that you get, even the negative ones. And then also content. This is another place you're going to start to tie in those, um, those stories and start to build the relationships with people uh, for the people who are using your programs and supporting your organization as well. Last but not least, you can start to tie in those paid ads. And uh, once you have those five essential tools set up, this is, again, where you can come in. You can use it to target the right people to really grow your email list, which is a big question we get all of the time, and even just directly drive donations. 
So Michelle, is there anything else you might want to leave the audience with today, something we covered or maybe something directly tied to end of year giving? Well, again, I, I think you, were, you, you hit it on the head, Stephanie, when you said think about your stories. Think about your stories and your impact. People, are, people engage with stories and they love visuals and they give where they feel like they're making a difference. And that speaks to the impact that you're having in the community, how together with your, your donors and your volunteers, you're making your community a better place. I love that sentiment. That, that is great. So while everyone is typing in final questions, I know we've got quite a few that have come in here. I do want to let you all know that we are here to help. Um, we've actually put together a guide. It's called the Download Making Sense of Online Marketing for Nonprofits. It dives into the topics we've talked about in a lot more detail, uh, you know, creating your website and things like that using social media. So we'll have Rachel actually, she beat me to it. She's already shared that in the chat window. So if you want to go in there and download that. And then I know Michelle also has some great content as uh, she'd love to share with you. Uh, Michelle and her team have put together some great content that you can get by joining her email list. We'll have Rachel share a link to that in the chat window as well. And Michelle, I don't know if you have uh, want to tell us a little bit about the content that you're sending out via email these days. Well, I did want to say that I uh, just in the last three weeks uh, revamped my website using the Constant Contact website builder. I was itching to give it a try, but I felt like I had to wait until, you know, it was really time for a, a website refresh. Um, so I hope you'll take a look at it. I'm really, I'm really thrilled with the way it turned out. And uh, I'm refreshing my email list and I plan to start sending regular little posts about just easy to use, really effective tips and tricks that you can use to promote your organization. Definitely. Michelle is an expert in this is in this space, so I would definitely recommend signing up for her email list so that you can get all of that really great content. So one last note before we get to those questions. When we close out of the webinar today, there is a survey that's going to pop up on your screen, and I would really love if you would take a minute or two just to answer two simple questions. It shouldn't take more than two minutes unless you want to write us a novel about hopefully how much you, you <laughs> loved the session today. So let's go ahead and get these questions. If you write a novel, I'll be sure to use it as content for my own, <laughs> my own awesome. email program. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. So this one actually came in earlier today in the email inbox for our webinars. And this one is from Barb. Barb wants to know the best and most effective way to use Facebook ads and getting the best bang for the buck. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about this. And first, I'm going to suggest that you um, do a lot of testing around it. Don't just run an ad once and say it didn't work or it did. You've got to try new things and simply see what works so that you can start to optimize the ads. There are so many options that you have in order to target the right people. You know, you can create your custom audience, but I think probably one of the, the most effective ways, if you have a, a good enough email list, you can do what's called a Facebook lookalike audience. And I used the wrong word there. A large enough, face, a large enough email list. I believe you have to have 300 uh, on your email list. Basically what that does is that learns the system will learn a little bit about those people on your email list so that you can then create an ad that targets people that look like those people who are already interested in your organization and active. So that can be a good way to go about it. I would also suggest uh, doing a lead ad for your organization. A lead ad is where you're going to be collecting their email address. So this would be where you pay up front to, uh, to basically reach them the first time. And then after that, they're on your email list. You don't have to pay to reach them again. You can have an influence to try to get them to volunteer with your organization or, or donate or whatever it might be. So that might be the best way to go. But again, definitely just test into it. And I would also say, as Michelle has kind of said throughout today, tie your stories into that. And that's going to really make them more powerful. 
So this next one also came in earlier from Brian in the inbox. Are there any fast ways of developing a list of people and organizations we want to receive our marketing email? Do you want to take a stab at that one? Well, one of the tools that I love is the um, text to join. Uh, and actually, uh, Stephanie, you mentioned that there are some, some people from uh, worship, faith based organizations. And this is actually one that we used at my church. Um, believe it or not, on Easter Sunday, we asked everyone to take out their cell phones, which is usually what we're asking them to turn off and put away. But that is how we started our list. We, we asked everyone to text uh, to join the, the church's mailing list, and that really got us rolling. So that's something that you can do at any, any event, anytime you're doing you know, a little public program. Um, that's a great way to, to jumpstart your efforts. And if you're using any sort of virtual events, that's you know, a great opportunity to ask people to join your list. Mm -hmm. And Constant Contact does have a text to join feature, which you'll see under the sign up tools tab right within your account. So mm -hmm. Rachel, I don't know if you wanna grab an FAQ for that and maybe share that in the chat window with everyone. I think that might be good information for everyone to, to yeah. know. And anytime you're doing uh, for the virtual, um, I add it to a slide at the end of my my uh, presentation. I say, here you go, text to join, and, and there you are. I love it. Yep. While you've got them as a as a captured audience and, a, and attentive, make sure you're asking them. Yeah. So Brian also has a question. Any tips for developing email distribution lists other than buying lists? Just talking about news emails rather than fundraising. My approach feels labor intensive and time consuming. So I think that what you just said um, tip can play a role in that. And you don't ever want to buy any sort of mailing list. You know, that's going to get you in a lot of trouble in a lot of different ways because those people aren't going to be interested in your organization. So it's not going to be worth your time or your money, unfortunately. And then you're going to start to get spam reports, which can cause even more problems for your sending domain. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other tips for maybe growing an email list? Well, um, actually, what I was, was thinking of when, when you were, Brian was talking about uh, what to send, another way to look, I know we've talked a lot about stories, another layer of thinking that might give you some ideas is what can you provide of value to people? Um, so if, if you're uh, on your website or through your social media, let, let's go for, for instance, the pet rescue. Say you're trying to build your list. And so you could uh, invite people to join your list. And as a response to them joining as part of their welcome email, you could maybe send them something like um, what to look for in a pet insurance policy or uh, tips for welcoming a new pet into your home. Something that the potential joiner would find valuable, something that would, you know, would, would, would help them in some way. I love and that. It's not, yeah. And it's not asking for money. It's not asking them to do it. You're actually giving them something. And that's that's a really nice community service. Yeah. For a lot of, you know, different types of businesses and stuff as well, we typically say, you know, don't make it so much about them joining your email list and getting them onto your list. It's really all about that value that mm -hmm. Michelle is talking about. So on your forms that you can uh, set up through Constant Contact, make sure you're, you're noting that if you've got that guide that Michelle is talking about or something similar to your organization, make sure you're noting that in the headline and doing a little description of it within the mm -hmm. form itself. All right, so this next one comes from Christy. Uh, she says, we have a long name that when you type into Google, the Google My Business comes up, but if you use the shortened version of our name, it does not. Is there anything we can do about that? It's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I have an answer to that one. Do you? I yeah, that that's an interesting question. I mean, um, if you could incorporate keywords, those types of keywords, I would make sure they're pulling up on your website because I know Google My Business has some sort of AI where it also pulls in information and also checks it with your website and things like that. So, I mean, I would have to do a little bit more research on that, yeah. but I would feel like you'd have to incorporate the keywords somewhere yeah. into the description. Right. 
And I'll do a little bit of research on that after we're done today, and then I can follow up with you, Christy. Awesome. So this next one comes from Jesse. I want to learn about how to use Facebook for end of year fundraising. What strategies are best here? And the same question for Instagram. Aside from the the technical parts, I think um, I think you want to think about your fundraising fundamentals. I mean, I think there are certain things that really don't change uh, no matter where you're where you're presenting them. So if you're doing you know a letter appeal or uh, an Instagram appeal, I think some of the fundamentals are the same. Focusing on the story, focusing on the impact, and helping people feel like they're doing something right in the community. Um, however that gets expressed and whatever media you use, I think, you know, use, you know, your imagination to your heart's content. But I, I think if you stick to the fundamentals, and let me mention something else, you know, we spend a lot of time in, in uh, programs like this talking about how to raise more dollars. And I would like to put a shout out uh, about stewardship. Uh, stewarding those donors and stewarding those do dollars because I think um, that's an important piece of maintaining the relationship. It's not just about getting new donors, it's about keeping the donors you have. And things like Facebook and Instagram uh, and, and uh, having a constant stream of reassurance to that community that you are having the impact that they want to see is gonna eventually lead to a better bottom line. And I think, you know, that stewardship and reaching out to your existing donors and supporters, you know, that's a great way to get people involved because once, you know, they're all about your organization, I think they're more likely to start sharing that with all of their friends and that can certainly yeah. expand. And, and every communication can't be about raising money. It can't be about asking for money. Yes. Um, nobody wants to be on the receiving end of that. Uh, Correct. So, keep you know th those are just and those are basic fundraising principles i think to keep in mind and i would say too you know make sure of course with that story you know it can incorporate visuals of mm -hmm. the people you're helping and mm -hmm. also video can be a really great way to tie into that even if it's uh like a video testimonial or of someone who's uh, benefited from your services or something like that those are especially great mm -hmm. in email and even on social media Mm -hmm. um, this next one comes from Susan. What about a recorded video in post in a blog? Is that a good idea? Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. And you know, actually, I just worked with somebody, not a nonprofit, but a, a consultant, and he he's just launching a series of videos at, with with blog posts. You know, sort of as a, a tandem thing, and. Um, you know, we, he wants to put them up on LinkedIn. He's a, a business to business consultant. And um, he's gonna, you know, LinkedIn, as, uh, among other platforms, has a place where you can post a, an article and also a video. And I said, why not put it in both places? You know, because you don't know, you don't always have control or even know how things are coming up in other people's feeds. Um, so the other thing I would say to that is, and I, and I did say this to him yesterday, don't be too afraid of repeating yourself about getting the most out of the content don't feel like everything has to be brand new because it may feel repetitive to you but the rest of the world is not going to see it that way because everybody isn't seeing everything all the time that's a really good po point you know get the most bang out of the content and the work that you're already doing right. and again Absolutely. saving yourself time yes awesome. yes Re repurpose 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 <laughs> Yes, remember that repurposing. <laughs> remember that word. <laughs> All right, so this next one I might be able to tackle. Uh, Christy asks, thoughts on Boost versus an ad on Facebook? So Boost means you're boosting a post and you're more focused on engagement and things like that with the post itself, whereas an ad is going to allow you to drive some different actions. You're going to be able to drive people directly to your website, to a, an, a donation page, um, or even use those at those lead ads in order to get people directly on your email list. So in most cases, I would say an ad is going to be more beneficial unless you're looking for boosting that post engagement. And I don't know if you have anything to add there, Michelle, but feel free to jump in. Nope, nope, you're good. You're good. Okay. 
All right, so Richard asks, what is the difference in purpose or goals between blog on a website and social media posts? Usually, um, what you know, the I think the blog, it's, your website, I think, is a good place for your blog to live. But I think the reality is a lot of people aren't going to go to your website looking for the blog. The social media, I like to think of it as sort of a, a loop. Social media and email are a way of put, you know, you put the blog, the information on your website, but you push it out through social media, through your email, and with those posts, try to loop them and, and bring them back to your your community. So when you put something out on social media, try to drive people to your email sign up. And when you push it out through you know, email, try to push it to your social media and try to get everybody to push back to your website. Um, but that's how I would see it. I don't, I think, in, I think there maybe was a time when people would go to websites looking for blog posts, but I, I think there's just too much going on out there now. And I just wouldn't expect to get a lot of organic traffic to your website to look at your blog post. But then again, it, it's a nice place to, to let it live. It's sort of your, think of it more as an archive of your blog. Yes, and having that tied to your website, so thinking about a question that someone might have about the particular services you offer, if they type that question into Google and you've answered uh, that question in a blog post, you're more likely to show up. So it's not like people are just, you know, like Michelle said, going to your website, sitting there and waiting for your next blog post. Right. They're more, you know, likely to see it within your social channels and your email campaigns. So that is a wonderful way to think about that and even explain it. Um, so this next one comes from Leah. If you are doing a matching gift campaign, how far in advance and how often should you send communications on all your platforms? Question oh. we get all the time. Yeah. And, you know, frequency is a funny thing. Um, and I, and I, I think going back to, Stephanie, what you said before about testing, you're going to have to do some testing to figure out what your community will tolerate um, with, you know, a ma you know matching, a matching campaign or a challenge campaign. You know, a lot depends on what the level is. You know, a $1,000 match, oh, you might want to do that, you know, in a, a week of, you know, heavy hitting promotions. If it's a capital campaign match, it's going to take a year or more. It, frankly, I guess the answer is it's it's going it's going to depend. I would have to, agree with you want, but you have to sort of assess the situation depending on what you're doing and what's going on. You'll you'll have and what again what your your community will will respond well to. And you know you've got those reports on social media, and you'll have reports in your email campaigns. Are people unsubscribing? Are yeah. uh, people clicking and opening more, pay attention to things like that. Um, also, you know, something that we typically say with campaigns or promotional things like that is think of a series of three email campaigns and three posts. Maybe about, well, depending on how far out you're planning your campaign and all of that, you know, maybe at the beginning of the month you send an announcement campaign. Mm -hmm. Then maybe about two weeks before your campaign ends, depending on your timeline, you want to remind people about your campaign. You know, hey, donate, and then let them know of the deadline. And then also, you know, a day or two before the campaign ends, send that last chance post or send that last chance email. Let them know that, um, you know, the campaign is ending tomorrow. Put mm -hmm. that sense of urgency behind it. And then after that, do a thank you or two. Thank yes. you. Know, celebrate. Celebrate. Say thank you. I love that. Um, this next one question says, our supporter base is pretty much all 65 plus. Should we be trying to connect with that same audience digitally or should we utilize digital marketing to expand our supporter base? Uh, e, all of the above. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, going back to, to my church community, you know, when um, the shutdown hit and, and we were very concerned about people's health, but we did want to continue to, to worship together. Uh, we started doing we call it literally Zoom church. Um, we do once a week, we do a live uh, service. And initially we thought, oh geez, you know, I, mean, I, I am one of the young people at this, <laughs> in this community. So, you know, um, we were really concerned about whether people would be able to participate. And I have to tell you, they are on. We are still doing all of our meetings, all of our study sessions. Um, 
you know, they, they bought into Zoom to a much greater degree than I, I would have ever imagined to the point where even after we're able to hold in-person sessions, we're gonna maintain the Zoom component for people who have moved or have difficulty. Now we're thinking the opportunities. Well, they, you know, they, in the winter when it's difficult to get out. So I, I would not uh, underestimate the over 60, uh, over 65 crowd at, at this point. I think, especially in this, this the pandemic, they've, they've really gotten on board with, uh, and, I, and, I, and they're good. They, they're, 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 like I said, they're in there. They are, you know, on, on Zoom as much as everybody else. So um, yes, definitely include, include thinking about these people and thinking about the, again, the opportunities. All of a sudden we, you know, we realize, well, when, you know, people move to other locations or the weather's bad and it's, it's difficult for them to get out, suddenly we, we've actually expanded what we can do, which would have never occurred to us before. I think that is a great point and a great example because, you know, we've got all these people 65 plus, which typically we wouldn't think that they're online, but the pandemic has probably changed all of that where they're getting online to go to church and they're also getting online to stay connected with their friends and their family. So yeah. wonderful point. I do see we are one minute past the top of the hour, and I know we've got some other questions that we did not get to. So we're going to work behind the scenes over the next couple of days here with Michelle. I think she's going to help us. <laughs> and we will actually post the answers to those questions on our community. So with that, within the next week or so, uh, look for that link in the follow-up email, and you'll be able to go there and see the answers to all the questions we didn't get to. Uh, Michelle, I want to thank you so much. You provided a ton oh, of great information so and knowledge for us. This was, this was so much fun. I, 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 I worried. I hope you didn't hear my rescue, new rescue puppy. I, I heard a little while ago. I thought, oh, there she goes. She's not being quiet. Oh, I didn't hear it at all, but <laughs> oh, I would have loved to see yeah. a rescue puppy. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna thank you all in the audience for attending and all of your great questions and engagement with us. Again, please take a minute to uh, tell us what you thought in the survey before you completely close out of the webinar. So thank you everyone, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye, Michelle. Thanks.